as I was preparing for uh, the first time that I was going to teach comparative vertebrate anatomy a number of years ago, um, I uh, was uh, spending Christmas break in Paraguay where I had uh, uh, served in the Peace Corps. And as, you know, family members had uh, birthdays, we would kind of do this, you know, the equivalent of like a pig roast, you know, for the whole family. But, you know, uh, I decided that, uh, you know, one year, one time I would get a, uh, get a goat for family members and it would be a big uh, family party, um, a sheep, et cetera. Uh, and then I figured that, um, you know, prior to the meal, I would just take lots of pictures, which would then serve in uh, my classes when I taught comparative vertebrate anatomy. Um, obviously, the first challenge that uh, you would uh, think is, all right, so where would you find um, a, uh, an anatomy book with the anatomy of the goat labeled so that, you know, you could take pictures and label everything for your students? Where would you find, you know, the sheep? Where would you find the cow? And then the, you know, I mean, the great thing is, you don't need one. And the reason for that is if you were to look at the arm muscles of uh, the goat, you see the deltoid, the triceps, the brachialis, the biceps brachii, you realize those are the same muscles that humans have. But then again, those are the same muscles which cats have. Those are the same muscles that you would see in uh, the cow, in the pig, in uh, the monkey. Um, and so that's one of the reasons to study comparative vertebrate anatomy. If every organism was different, this would be exhausting. I mean, there are tens of thousands of vertebrates. Um, and so if you had to study tens of thousands of distinct body plans, no one can retain that information. But if you could study, say, one set of arm muscles with the idea that all, you know, 4,000 species of mammals have essentially modified this ancestral set so that they're extremely similar within, you know, some, you know, unique attributes that might um, uh, occur in certain uh, lineages, uh, then it makes it understandable. With a little bit of knowledge, you can then understand, you know, uh, a great deal uh, of the biology of uh, organisms. And, um, uh, and so uh, with that, I'd like to continue with uh, my treatment of the, uh, uh, the skeletal uh, muscles of vertebrates. Uh, the first uh, video uh, started off with uh, the head uh, muscles and just some more general information um, and you know the erector spinae in the back. Um, now I'd like to uh, continue uh, with the trunk and arm muscles in this video and then I'll make a, a following video with uh, the muscles of the hip and uh, the uh, leg. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, problems that amphibians uh, had was that the ancestral fish had bones which connected the uh, scapula to the um, uh, to the shoulder, and so uh, therefore, uh, as far as structural stability, there was a bony anchor between the shoulder and the skull. There was no neck; the, the shoulder was part of the skull. Um, uh, once uh, vertebrates um, uh, evolved the neck, and there was actually some sauropodian fish like Tiktaalik which had a neck prior to the amphibians. Um, this then became a problem. Now the shoulder is much more free to move. It is our most mobile joint and that's good. Um, but we not only need mobility, we need stability as well, or else you know, uh, uh, parts are injured and dislocated and the rest. And so therefore, if there is no bony you know, protection for the, the scapula, the scapula isn't held in place by any bones. Uh, so then muscles then had to take that role and form a sling for the scapula, which uh, held it uh, in uh, place. And so there are three, if we were to look then at the uh, alligator on the anterior side, underneath the pectoralis muscles is the serratus anterior. And then uh, on the posterior side, there are rhomboids and elevator scapulae. And together, these three uh, muscles serve as a sling from the scapula. Uh, sling for the scapula. Here you can see this on uh, the cat uh, coming from uh, the ribs. And when I show you a picture in a second, you'll see that you know, there are origins of this muscle on different ribs. Um, the serratus anterior uh, on the anterior or ventral side. And on the dorsal side, we have uh, rhomboids and a levator scapulae. Um, uh, these uh, form uh, the sling uh, for uh, the scapula. And once again, this is wonderful in you know, organisms as uh, diverse as you know, the cat and uh, the alligator, uh, we, would, uh, we would see that. 
Uh, so let me just uh, go uh, back. Um, and so uh, when uh, we uh, then do dissections, here's the alligator, here is uh, uh, the chicken. Uh, once again, uh, rhomboids and elevator scapulae. Uh, you can see here, you can see the uh, rhomboids on uh, the uh, opossum. Um, but this was a vertebrate, you know, a land vertebrate problem. Once the scapula was no longer attached to the skull, you need to support it in place. And here on the cap, the rhomboids, uh, the labator uh, uh, scapulae, um, and then uh, the serratus anterior, uh, which we'll, we'll see uh, in just a second. Uh, so once again, uh, if we look at the artiodactyls, like the goat, the sheep, the like, you'll see uh, the rhomboids there. Uh, uh, very often, you can have lineages like the pectoralis muscles. They can get split differently. A pectoralis mass of muscles can be split differently in different species. We can have a rhomboid major and a minor. There's the levator, uh uh, scapulae uh, there in uh, the cow and the monkey. Uh, here you can see the cat, the serratus anterior. Note that there's different origins on different ribs and so it kind of has this, this fan uh, shape that makes it easy to identify. You can see the same in uh, the opossum and uh, the sheep and the bear in, uh, in the monkey. Um, uh, so uh, that's one set of uh, shared uh, uh, muscles. Um, let's go to uh, uh, now some of the, the muscles of the trunk which move uh, the arm. Obviously, when we think of uh, muscles, muscles never push, muscles only pull. Okay, so that's an important lesson. Muscles never push, muscles only pull. And they pull typically uh, one of their attachments, which we call the insertion. Typically when a muscle is attached to two spots, one of them tends to move and one of them tends to stay still. We call the stable one the origin, the movable one the insertion. And so here in humans, we have a latissimus uh, dorsi uh, that starts uh, in the midline of the back. The spinous processes of lumbar vertebrae, the iliac uh, crest, and some of the inferior ribs. And then it goes to the arm. Between on the humerus at the proximal end, there are these two bumps, tubercles. There's a groove between them, the intertubercular sulcus. Um, and that's where uh, this um, muscle attaches. And if then what happens is it attaches to the arm, but its origin is on the midline of the back. And so it pulls the arm towards the back. That can um, extend it if the arm is um, abducted, that can adduct it, and that can immediately rotate it as well, given where uh, it inserts. So uh, here in humans, we see this uh, big uh, latissimus uh, dorsi. And once again, this is just an overview, you know, so obviously, you know, I'll have videos which, you know, go through this in humans specifically, so it does a number of functions. Um, but obviously, this is a, an important job that any vertebrate you know, could have, where you want to move the arm, and obviously the, the vertebrae of the back, that's a nice anchoring point. And so a muscle which attaches to the, uh, the vertebrae uh, in uh, the back and then pull on uh, the arm. And so we see a latissimus dorsi in uh, the frog. Uh, and so uh, here you can see it uh, there where it can pull out one uh, uh, the arm. Now, um, when we talk about homologous uh, muscles, uh, it's not just that they're in similar places. Uh, we can trace uh, that they're descended from a common uh, ancestor. We can show you know, their embryological development, their innervations, the genes they express, you know, the points of the bones where they originate and um, uh, insert. Now, there are sometimes differences where, you know, the insertion in a reptile is a little different, you know, from in, in humans, etc. But nevertheless, these are homologous ancestors. The early land tetrapods had a latissimus dorsi. And then as we look at frogs, salamanders, alligators, birds, and mammals, um, we see a latissimus uh, dorsi having been uh, inherited from um, uh, those, uh, uh, those earlier uh, uh, form. So here's an uh, opossum um, uh, uh, representing a, a more uh, basal uh, lineage of mammal. Once again, if you, you know, have a muscle attaching to the uh, spinous processes of vertebrae and you attach to the arm, right, you know, obviously this can then um, uh, uh, pull it uh, posteriorly. Um, 
Uh, and so here you can see it on the opossum. Uh, it's a, uh, a thin sheet of uh, muscle, uh, but quite uh, broad. You can see the same in the cat. Look how broad this muscle is, a big sheet. It's very thin, all right? Uh, and then we can see it once again, uh, this is now typical once you learn the muscles of one vertebrate, you can apply it to others. So here you see the lithus and the storsi in various artiodactyls that go to the cow, uh, the sheep, uh, the, uh, the pig. Um, uh, here you can see it in uh, the monkey, uh, this broad, uh, thin uh, sheet of the lithus and this uh, dorsi. Right? So uh, this is an important uh, trunk uh, muscle in uh, vertebrates. If we were to then look at the opposite uh, side, there is this mass of pectoralis muscles, chest muscles. So once amniotes had long ribs and a sternum, um, then um, obviously here's a place where you can anchor muscles. This is where the origin uh, can be. And then they can insert on the arm, right? So not only can you start from the midline of the back and attach the arm here, you can start from the front. So the pectoralis, uh, muscles, their origin will be on the midline. So, you know, the sternum um, have ribs uh, one through uh, seven, uh, the clavicle, and then they can insert uh, onto uh, the proximal end of the humerus near the uh, uh, insertion of the latissimus dorsi. And here we can, you know, and now we can pull on the arm from the anterior surface as well. So this can help flex the arm, pulling it forward. Once again, if the arm is abducted, if we pull it towards the midline, that adducts the DD excuse me, adducts the arm, and also it immediately rotates the arm. Now, obviously, you know, uh, humans being primates, we have more uh, mobile uh, shoulders uh, for uh, hanging, you know, different animals uh, which, you know, uh, use their arms to run. They might use it in a, a little different way, but nevertheless, these pectoralis, uh, this pectoralis complex, this, these chest muscles, they then attach uh, to, um, uh, the arm. Uh, once again, it forms this mass um, that different uh, species can split up differently. And so as we look at, you know, here in the cat, you see a pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, and say uh, humoralis. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the way that uh, this uh, chest uh, sheet of muscle is split uh, can, um, uh, can vary uh, a bit. Um, but once again, there would be these uh, pectoralis uh, muscles which would be um, a fairly uh, standard. Uh, humans have a pectoralis minor, uh, starting on three ribs, and then going to the coracoid process of, uh, of the scapula. Um, now, because this one, the pectoralis minor, only attaches to the shoulder, it does not attach to the uh, humerus. It doesn't technically move the arm, it moves the scapula. So if I were to pull on the shoulder blade from here, the points on these three ribs, I would be, uh, protracting and depressing the scapula, pulling the, the scapula to these points. So uh, uh, there is a pectoralis minor, uh, which is underneath then the pectoralis uh, major, which once again can flex, adduct, and medially rotate uh, the arm uh, based on uh, you know its uh, uh, its attachment uh, points. Um, if we were to then look at, at diverse uh, vertebrates, once again, there's this pectoralis uh, complex, like in a frog, we would just call it the pectoralis and the salamander, uh, a pectoralis. Um, but then, you know, come uh, mammals, uh, it could be subdivided into different groups. Here you can see the pectoralis of uh, the alligator. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the, the flight muscles, uh, specifically with birds at the very end, but obviously the challenging part for a bird is the downstroke of the wing, the downstroke of the wing. That's where the work is involved in flight. And so birds have huge chest muscles. In fact, they have that carina. They don't have a flat sternum the way that I do. They have a carina where it comes out to here. And so the chest muscles are here. We know that from, you know, yeah, eating chicken or eating turkey, you know, the enormous uh, pectoralis complex that we see uh, in uh, birds. Here you can see it uh, once again in uh, the cat. Uh, if you're careful, you can then you know, subdivide it into uh, separate um, uh, muscles like the, the pectoralis uh, minor uh, there. Um, 
And this is different from the pectoralis minor in humans. In, in humans, uh, it is um, uh, has a different uh, position, uh, you know, underneath the pectoralis uh, major. Here we can see it in uh, goats, uh, sheep, etc. You know, this big pectoralis complex with a major and minor. Um, and then even when, oh, right. I'm sorry, I thought I had the monkey somewhere. The monkey is very interesting in that the monkey still has a pectoralis minor, which uh, resembles um, what we would see um, at, in a typical uh, mammal. Um, and then since that lineage, the pectoralis minor is underneath the pectoralis uh, major uh, in uh, humans. So here you can see the pectoralis minor originating from three ribs. It is underneath the pectoralis uh, major. Okay. Uh, so uh, those are uh, the muscles of uh, the, uh, the trunk. Uh, so the latissimus dorsi on the back, the pectoralis complex on um, uh, the front. I'm sorry. I think this was the one I did. Uh, yeah, I did. I just um, now just going through. Um, then, yeah, so I'm pretty sure. So just as this play, um, the next muscle I'd like to, uh, so here you can see the pectoralis uh, major, uh, once again, uh, having its origin on uh, the midline and then being able to pull the arm uh, towards uh, that point. Um, so uh, uh, even uh, sharks, we'll start to talk a bit about fish as we start getting into arms and, and fins. Um, but even uh, here, there is a, uh, a mass of muscles which can now pull the, um, uh, the fin uh, uh, ventrally. And so uh, sharks have uh, a pectoralis uh, complex as well. Uh, and once again, I'll be talking about uh, flight muscle uh, towards uh, the end. And so uh, here in bird, you can see this huge carina. It's not a flat, flat uh, breastbone. Uh, it has that uh, very large um, process uh, from it, uh, which then allows um, the muscle to be so, uh, so large. Okay. Um, now I'd like to talk about uh, the uh, deltoid. Now, uh, there are different things that, uh, just to sort of from the human perspective, we want our arms to do. We want our arms to flex, in which case we have to pull on them from this direction. Once again, muscles only pull, they don't push. So if you want your arm to move this way, you need a muscle on this side to pull. If you need your muscle, your arm to uh, extend, um, you need a muscle on the posterior side to pull backwards on it. Um, if you need your muscle to adduct, so if your arm is like this, you want to pull it towards the midline. Adduct is to pull towards uh, the midline. Um, then uh, we need uh, a muscle whose origin is on the midline to pull on the arm. So the pectoralis major, uh, its origin is on the midline and it attaches to the arm so it can adduct from the front. The latissimus dorsi, its origin is on the midline and it attaches to the arm from behind. So both of them can adduct the arm. Next question, from where can you abduct the arm. So if I want to do this with my arm, where can I do it? And I always encourage my students, you know, always try to you know, simulate muscles. Like put your hand somewhere. It's all right, well, if this is say the origin of my palm, this is, you know, the insertion of my fingertip and I pull, where can I pull my arm and have it do this? And the answer is you need to be at the proximal end of a bone, of a limb in this case, the arm, attaching from the lateral side. So if I have a muscle that's at the proximal end of the arm attaching from the lateral side, then as I pull the lateral side towards the origin, which is closer to the midline, that would then abduct the uh, arm. Um, and so uh, we humans, we have this muscle called a deltoid. Now the deltoid, as we'll see in mammals, comes in pieces and together they form this one big deltoid. Sometimes um, it's difficult as we study other animals, especially once you get into reptiles and amphibians, because a, molega, a, a muscle might be homologous to some degree, but not, so it's not the same as the, the, the deltoid, but like this part might be homologous to that part of the deltoid. And so some anatomists might then choose, well, rather than call it the deltoid because it's so different, you know, it's a little homologous, it's 
part not homologous, um, we'll give it another uh, name like a dorsalis scapulae. Um, but then the problem then becomes if you're reading books and you're trying to relate, you know, here's a, uh, you know, a bone in the alligator, uh, here's a muscle in the alligator, here's a muscle in the, in the salamander, how do they uh, uh, relate? Obviously that can be uh, uh, difficult. Um, in mammals, uh, the typical pattern is to have three deltoid muscles, a clavodeltoid attaching to uh, the uh, clavicle, and a chromiodeltoid coming from the acromium of the scapula, and a spinodeltoid coming from the spine of the scapula. So three separate, um, uh, three separate uh, muscles. Um, uh, in humans, these three fuse to form this one single mass. Now, while all of them acting together could abduct the arm, the one in front can pull on the arm from uh, in front and help flex the arm. The spinal delta one on the back, uh, pulling on the back can help uh, extend the arm. So, uh, uh, the deltoid does multiple things. So muscles often have very complex functions. In a text you might read, oh, it abducts the arm. That's good, that's a good place to start. But then very often there's a paragraph. Oh, and this portion can help flex the arm, this portion can help extend the arm, um, et cetera. So what was uh, three separate muscles in uh, ancestral uh, mammals has fused to make one uh, solid uh, muscle in humans, all inserting on that deltoid tuberosity of the humerus, which is part way down uh, the shaft. I just, once again, the, the Greek letter delta is a triangle. Um, and so that's why it's called the deltoid. It has this uh, triangular um, uh, this uh, triangular shape. Uh, so uh, if you pull on the arm uh, from uh, the proximal end coming in at the lateral side, uh, you can abduct the arm. But once again, uh, portions of it can also help to extend and uh, flex uh, the arm as well. Very often muscles have uh, more, um, uh, more complex uh, functions. So once again, we could call it the dorsalis scapulae um, in, uh, uh, here in the salamander or here in the uh, frog, you know, and it's partially uh, homologous. So here was the latissimus and then here's the dorsalis uh, scapulae uh, next to it. Um, uh, once again, different authors will call it different things, but you can see it referred to as the deltoid in uh, reptiles here, the turtle uh, there, the uh, alligator uh, a second ago. Uh, and then I showed you um, uh, uh, these images uh, here. All right. Uh, and so I haven't uh, bothered in, the, in most of these images to separate into the three separate uh, sections. You can kind of see them here in the impossum. There's the uh, clavodeltoid, acromiodeltoid, and spinodeltoid. Uh, and I'm just kind of, um, you know, just lumping them all together uh, to show uh, the, uh, the deltoid uh, region homologous to that in uh, humans. Here you can see uh, in, uh, in the monkey. Okay. Um, so that's the deltoid. Now, if you remove the deltoid, uh, we can see a number of uh, important uh, muscles called the rotator uh, cuff. Uh, and the rotator cuff uh, muscles are important uh, for two reasons. One, they allow movements, and I'll you know, review the movements. Um, but then secondly, uh, they also help to stabilize the shoulder. The shoulder is the um, most mobile joint of uh, the human body. And there's a price that comes with mobility. Thus, it's also then the most uh, vulnerable to injury. It's the most frequent, frequently dislocated joint. And so we need to stabilize the shoulder, but there isn't a whole lot of bony support there. I mean, if you consider the hip, the ball at the head of the femur fits ah, so nicely into the acetabulum. The two surfaces are really made for each other. If you look at the ball and socket joint of the shoulder for the head of the humerus, fits into that space formed by uh, the acromion, the chloroquid process, and the glenoid cavity, eh, not so good. All right, so the shoulder doesn't have two bony surfaces which match the same way that the hip does. And without that bony support, you know, um, uh, for the joint, uh, then tendons of muscles become more important. And there are four 
uh, muscles, which in addition to allowing for movement, their tendons help to stabilize the shoulder. On the anterior surface, there's one of the four, the subscapularis. And then on the um, posterior uh, surface, there are three. Now remember that live bearing mammals, theory in mammals, they evolved an important change of the scapula. There's a ridge called a spine. So live bearing mammals have a spine on their scapula. And um, two of uh, the three muscles on the posterior side are named for the spine. There's the supraspinatus, which originates over the spine, the infraspinatus, which originates under the spine, and then the teres minor. There's also a teres major, but that is not a rotator cuff uh, muscle. Um, and so the four of these uh, then are important in uh, supporting the, uh, 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 the strength of the shoulder. Now, the supraspinatus is under the deltoid. And once again, it's attaching from the arm at the proximal end from the lateral side. So it helps to abduct the arm. So the supraspinatus can help to abduct the arm in addition to the, uh, the deltoid. Uh, the infraspinatus has its origin in the infraspinous fossa, the teres minus, teres minor, from the inferior lateral border of the scapula. They both uh, insert uh, here on the greater tubercle of uh, the humerus, as does the uh, supraspinatus. Um, and if you attach to the shoulder from there and you pull from uh, to, to the humerus from there and you pull on it, what are you doing? You are laterally rotating. So this is laterally rotating uh, the, uh, the arm. Um, the, there you go. So uh, whereas the subscapularis, uh, which is on the anterior surface, I had to make some of the ribs go away in order to see it. Uh, if you attach to the lesser tubercle of the humerus from this side and you pull on the humerus, you're immediately rotating uh, the, uh, uh, the arm. And so we have these rotator cuff muscles important for stabilizing uh, the uh, shoulder, um, but then also uh, capable of causing movements. Uh, the supraspinatus can uh, assist the um, uh, can assist the deltoid in abducting. Here you can see the subscapularis. Once again, it's the only one on the anterior surface. Um, it medially rotates uh, the uh, humerus. Uh, the teres. Uh, minor and the infraspinatus, they will laterally rotate uh, the, uh, uh, the humerus. So here you can see the teres minor. Once again, if you pull on the arm uh, from this point of the gripper to, to pull you laterally rotate it. Here's the supraspinatus helping to abduct the arm. It is above the spine of the scapula. And somewhere there was the infraspinatus. Somewhere. Um, and um, uh, so then if we were to start looking at um, uh, verb, which we would see these. Now, here's a muscle called the supracoracoideus, which is very important when we talk about flight and birds. Um, remember that before the live birth mammals, there's no spine of the scapula. So you can't have a supraspinatus and an infraspinatus on either side of the spine if there's no spine. So prior to the live birth mammals, there's one single muscle called the supracoracoideus that live birtherian mammals would then split to make the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Here you see an opossum, and this is the subscapularis on the anterior surface. Um, and then we can uh, see here on the opossum being a live birth mammal, there's a spine of the scapula, and now there's a supraspinatus and an infraspinatus a bird, an alligator, uh, even uh, an egg-laying mammal would have a muscle called a supracoracoideus uh, in stent. Uh, and so we have uh, these rotator cuff muscles as uh, you, um, uh, as you, um, as you've seen here. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus. And so I have on uh, my website, uh, the images of these here, you can see in the monkey, the deltoid has been removed. Here's the spine of the scapula. You can see the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor. Once again, there is a teres major, uh, but that is not a, um, uh, that is not a, uh, uh, a rotator cuff muscle. Now I'll mention this in a second. If you take away the pectoralis major of the bird, 
underneath that, then you see the uh, supracoracoideus. And if you recall from the, the lecture on bones, birds have this really neat trick where the tendon of the supracoracoideus then comes up through a hole, the triosseal canal. And so then it can function uh, in flight for the uh, up uh, stroke of uh, the wing, uh, but I'll get to that at uh, the end. So uh, those are some muscles in the uh, shoulder. Uh, now I'd like to uh, move uh, to the arm uh, itself. And so uh, we have a couple of uh, muscles uh, which cross multiple joints. So for example, the biceps brachii or the triceps brachii, if they start on the shoulder and they insert on the bones of the forearm, they cross two joints. So they cross the shoulder joint and thus can move the arm, but they also then cross the elbow joint and then can move the forearm. And so uh, and therefore, if you ask uh, what do these muscles do, they can do multiple things. And it often depends on what other muscles are doing. So if other muscles say stabilize one part of the body, then they can have a, uh, a different function. So you could flex the arm, you could flex uh, the, uh, uh, the forearm. Um, but uh, in the uh, amniotes, they're pretty standard where there's a biceps uh, brachii uh, more on um, uh, the medial side. Uh, there is a brachialis more on the lateral side. These are flexors. And once again, if muscles only pull, all right, then if we pull from this side, you know, you can flex the arm, you can flex the forearm. Um, and so uh, the muscles of the arm that we're going to see are going to be flexors of the forearm if they attach to the forearm bones, uh, flexors of the shoulder if they cross the shoulder uh, joint. Um, uh, and so here in humans, there are two separate origins for the biceps. It has two heads, uh, hence the term. The brachialis is a shorter muscle. It doesn't cross the shoulder joint. It's only going to uh, cross the elbow joint. So both can flex the forearm, the brachialis and the biceps. The brachialis inserts um, onto uh, uh, the ulna, the biceps, onto the, uh, the radial tuberosity of the, uh, of the radius. Um, but uh, the biceps uh, brachii can also then flex uh, the uh, arm at uh, the shoulder as, uh, as well. Uh, so once again, there are two separate uh, origins uh, here. I'll get to the fish in a, in a second. Oh, well, I'm sorry, why don't I talk about that? Um, so, um, where do these muscles uh, come from? Uh, well, fish certainly have uh, muscles which can pull on their fins and do the equivalent of flexing uh, their fins. Here I'm just talking about like movement in this plane is flexing. So not only flexing the elbow or the shoulder, but also flexing the wrist, the digits. So the flexors are all on the anterior side. Um, going back to, you know, here's a shark. There are certainly muscles which can flex the fin in this comparable region. But it wasn't until the Sarcopterygian fish that had these interesting fins. So look at this fin. It doesn't look like a typical fish fin because there are bones actually going in the fin and there are muscles between uh, the bones. And so unlike the fins of most fish, the muscles which are moving the fin are actually within uh, the fin and then can be split to anterior flexors and uh, posterior um, uh, extensors. Right. Um, and so uh, we'll see this on, um, we don't really have a biceps uh, brachii uh, when uh, we look at uh, amphibians. Once again, um, uh, when you're going to the more distantly related you know, amphibians, uh, so while there is a triceps, uh, which is homologous to our triceps, uh, there are a couple of muscles in the region of the biceps and, and the brachialis, uh, but most authors will you know, give them different names and not you know, call them directly homologous. Uh, so amphibians are a little you know, tougher. Uh, by the time we get to uh, amniotes, uh, we do uh, share uh, more similarities. Uh, cats, just as we do, have a brachialis on the uh, lateral uh, side, a uh, biceps brachii on 
uh, the medial side here, we see that in um, the, um, uh, the arm. And then here, there are lots and lots of um, uh, flexors in uh, the forearm, which are then going to flex the wrist and the digits. Uh, now, there are lots of these, and they can be divided differently in different organisms. Very often, if you listen to their name, so something like the there's a flexor carpi a radialis, a flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor means to this. Carpa, I mean, refers to the carpus. So these are wrist flexors. And now one would be on the side of the ulna on the medial side. The flexor carpi ulnaris would be the medial uh, one where the flexor carpi radialis uh, would be uh, the uh, lateral uh, one. Uh, there's a flexor digitorum, you know, which can flex uh, digits. Uh, there can um, be a flexor pollicis, an abductor pollicis, uh, which will then move the, um, uh, the thumb. Uh, the Latin for uh, thumb is uh, pollux. And so if you were to say, look at a cat, uh, once again, we can see the, you know, the, tri uh, the biceps brachii, which can flex um, uh, the arm and can flex uh, the uh, elbow. And then when we look at the uh, forearm, so here's the cat once again, uh, we can see all of these uh, flexors. And there are so many that very often to see them all, you have to like do it in layers. So they're the muscles superficially, you can cut those and then there would be a, a deeper compartment under, uh, underneath uh, that. So keep in mind that, you know, animals which are you know, using their arms as legs essentially, still have the same muscles um, that we do. So going back to what I had started this uh, lecture with, um, you can identify the muscles of a four-footed mammal, you know, uh, thinking of the muscles which you have in your arm, even though you're not using your arm to support your body's weight. Once again, the biceps brachii has two a separate origins on the scapula and thus two heads. That's what biceps mean, two heads. And here you can see it in the uh, monkey. And once again, once you get into the forearm, you have a number of different uh, uh, flexors there, some superficial, some deeper. Now I'm focusing on flexing and extending, but obviously there's other motions of the arms. There's you know, pronation where we point the palms posteriorly and there's a uh, supination and so there are muscles called, you know, the pronator teres, the supinator. Uh, so there are uh, muscles there. Now, obviously, uh, you know, I can kind of repeat a lot of what I just said. Now, talking about the posterior side of the arm, which is where we extend from. So if you pull the arm from uh, behind, that's what's called extension. And when we're in anatomic position, our arm is extended. But the same thing is true when we pull on the elbow from the posterior division, we extend the elbow. When we pull on the wrist from the posterior, we extend the wrist, we extend the digit. And so just as the anterior, the ventral side was where the flexors are, the posterior side is where the extensors are. There's one really big extensor uh, in uh, the upper arm. Um, yeah, sorry about a woman's arm there. It did too many rotations. Um, there is a, um, a triceps brachii, but then it would be in the posterior compartment of the forearm that we would have the wrist extensors and the digit uh, extensors. Uh, you know, and then once again, you know, going back to, you know, sharks have um, a muscle mass which can uh, attach to the fin and extend the fin, but it wasn't until the Sarcopterygian fish uh, that we had actually bones in, you know, these uh, fins and muscles which move them. Uh, the triceps is homologous when we look at uh, animals uh, like uh, frogs and uh, salamanders, and there are um, the uh, extensors of the wrist and uh, digits as, as well. So that was a, uh, a frog. And then we would see the same in the, uh, uh, the alligator. Uh, here you can see uh, the, um, uh, the opossum. Once again, there are uh, compartments here. So there are superficial extensors, uh, deeper extensors. Uh, just as the biceps had two heads inserting in two different parts, the uh, triceps has three heads a medial head, a lateral head, and a uh, long head, but all the same insertion onto the elbow at 
the olecranon process. Um, and so here's the, the big triceps brachii in the cat on the posterior of the arm. And here you can see uh, how big it is. And then here you can see all of those uh, uh, extensors for the wrist and the digits uh, in the forearm, once again, in, uh, in different uh, layers. Uh, once again, you know, even though animals use their arms to walk on, they still have the same triceps brachii that you have in your arm, you know, even though you're using it for a different, uh, a different uh, function. So uh, start to wrap up, I have an, another video that uh, you know, talks about uh, the, the triceps. Let me, before I go back to my website, let me uh, just uh, look at uh, the muscles of light. Um, gargoyles in you know, images have wings that you know, pop out of their back and they still have arms. So then whatever muscles would move those, they would be unique. Um, but the wings of birds are not that. The wings of birds are modified arms. The bones of the wing, these are modified arm bones. So then the muscles of flight uh, would then be modified um, and muscles which move the arm. So you know, birds don't have unique you know, uh, muscles. They've just modified uh, the you know, common ancestral muscles. So the important wing and the important muscle is the big pectoralis complex, which provides the downstroke of the, uh, of the wing. Um, the first birds did not have this uh, keel or carina or in their sternum. So they would have been much more challenged you know, to take off from a standstill, or maybe they would have had to get a running start or leap out of a branch rather than be able to fly um, as well. So powered flight, you know, might not have been something that the very first birds uh, were, um, uh, were capable of. But here you can see just how big an area uh, birds have dedicated to the origin of uh, the pectoralis muscles. So, you know, clearly that's, uh, the pectoralis is that important uh, muscle uh, for uh, flight. Um, and, uh, here uh, they have a homologue of the deltoid, we'll call it the deltoideus, um, and uh, its insertion is the deltoid tuberosity of the, uh, of, of the humerus. Uh, it can uh, flex the arm as does uh, our deltoid, and it can help to uh, rotate uh, the wing. Underneath the uh, deltoid is the supercoracoideus. Once again, this is the homologue of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, but notice that the scapula of the bird does not have a spine. So the supracoracoideus does not get split there. Um, once again, I pointed this out with the skeleton, that really you know, neat trick of not the first birds, but after the first birds had uh, evolved tens of millions of years later, there was a group called uh, the ornithothoraces, the bird thorax. They'd had a number of changes here, which made them capable of powered flight in a way that the first birds were not. And one of the big changes was that the tendon of this muscle, the supracoracoideus, um, goes through a hole, what's called the triosseal canal, because the scapula, the prochoracoid, and the furcula, that's the, the wishbone or the fused clavicles, uh, these three bones come together and form a hole, and the tendon of this muscle goes up and through the hole to then attach onto the humerus. So here's the trick. A bird needs to pull its wings up as it's flying. Now the sensible place to put that would be on the back. But the problem is if you had a big back muscle to pull your, your wings you know, uh, backwards, that would change the center of gravity. It would mean the wings were kind of fighting against the weight of this muscle. It would not be as efficient for flight. But if a muscle that's underneath the, uh, the wing can nevertheless have a tendon which you know, scoots over and attaches from above, you could actually be pulling the wing backwards using a muscle which is on the front. That's a neat trick. And it improved the center of gravity and uh, made uh, birds uh, better flyers. Uh, so uh, the first birds did not have this, um, but it was uh, that ornithothoraces group that had a number of modifications of the thorax, which changed the center of gravity and made flight more efficient and uh, made uh, birds better for powered flight. So you have these three bones that come together and then you have a channel and a hole where they come together. 
and the tendon of the supracoracoideus uh, super goes through that, um, uh, that hole. And uh, this then allows um, uh, for, uh, uh, for a powered uh, flight. Um, then there are other muscles. So there are rhomboids in levator scapula. They have a sling. Birds have a sling for the scapula, uh, just as others uh, do. Um, uh, and you know, I, I know you know very often you when know, people when studying the wings of uh, you know birds at some point start thinking of you know the wings that they like to eat. Uh, so you know there is a latissimus uh, dorsi uh, as uh, well. There's a teres uh, major. So once again, these are all muscles which we're familiar with. Birds did not invent new muscles; they just modified the muscles in the dinosaur arms. There is a biceps uh, brachii. Um, uh, once uh, again, we would uh, expect that there is a triceps uh, uh, brachii, and so you know uh, birds can flex and extend uh, their arms uh, just as uh, uh, as you know we can. And then you know the carpal metacarpus then has carpal bones and digits, and so then there are bo uh, uh, bones in the forearm, uh, such as the flexor carpi ulnaris, the ulnaris lateralis, uh, etc., which then um, I can flex uh, the arm. There are extensors of uh, the arm, uh, etc. And so, um, uh, birds did not need new muscles for uh, flight. Uh, these were um, simply uh, now the um, and the ancestral uh, uh, muscle. Um, now, I did say that you know we do see some small modifications, and then just deep to the skin. Um, there is this expansor secundarium, uh, which then inserts onto feather uh, follicles and then can help extend uh, these uh, feathers. Uh, and so we can see this in a possum as well. And you know, there's just this you know, uh, a thin sheet of uh, muscle, which is just deep to the skin. Uh, birds have uh, modified, um, have modified that and have attached then uh, to uh, uh, two feathers. Uh, so that uh, kind of uh, uh, concludes uh, this overview of vertebrate muscles. But once again, at my website at bio.sunyorange.edu, uh, I have a number of images of uh, various dissections. And once again, if you were in uh, in a uh, you know a lab uh, setting and and trying to you know distinguish between some of those different you know, uh, um, form uh, muscles on the posterior side, which uh, perform uh, uh, extension or some of uh, the muscles on, here's in uh, the monkey on uh, the, oh, once again, the posterior uh, doing uh, extension or on uh, the anterior uh, side performing uh, flexion. There are some resources here. So that is an overview of the uh, arm, uh, trunk, and shoulder uh, muscles, uh, primarily of the land vertebrates.